the importance of the commandments. That's our topic this morning. Welcome to another week, another parasha, parasha of Etkanan, which is the second parasha of uh, the book of Devarim. And we have a, a really uh, important topic today to bear down on why uh, the mitzvot of the Torah uh, is so important. I think it really kind of fits nicely with uh, the drosh that we had on Shabbat, and we're going to dive right into that. So welcome. Be sure and uh, subscribe to our channel if you've not done that already. Strike the bell so that you can be kept up to date on all of our uh, videos and information we have coming out here. And be sure and comment on this video. Let me know your takeaway. We're, so we're beyond the three weeks now. We had the Tisha B'Av fast yesterday, and uh, we had the commemoration of the, the temple, and I pray that everybody had opportunity to, to do some self-reflection. But we've just begun, we've really just begun the period of, of Teshuvah, which really the, the, the ultimate period of Teshuvah in Judaism is the 40 days of Teshuvah, which begins here in just a, a, a couple of weeks with the, the beginning of Elul. And so uh, we've only just begun. We've only just begun the journey. And so, as I said during Shabbat, really the three weeks is more or less kind of a warm up. But we are now past the three weeks, which the good news about that is the morning period is over. We have the a joy. We get to listen to music, praise God, and uh, and so on and so forth. So welcome, glad you're here. Now let's let's talk about the commandments and 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 you know, golly, I, I really I really wish I wish this this message. Uh, a message like today, I, and, and well, maybe all the messages, but particularly today, I wish a message like today could have, you know, 50,000 views and you know, it would go viral. Uh, um, it's it's unfortunate. Uh, yesterday, driving uh, around, passing uh, some church buildings and seeing the parking lot full of people, you know, I really wish that those people could hear a message like today and, and, and really... Uh, come to appreciate and understand the truth of God's word, because uh, it's not about um, proving people wrong or, or, or uh, you know, bashing a, a false faith system or something like it. You know, it's not about that. It's really about people and wanting to see them prosper and wanting to see them really operate within the truth of, of God's reality, as opposed to something that's, that's uh, not. And, it really comes back to ultimately the commandments of God, which remember, um, you know, I want to drill this into your head, you know, like, like a branding iron, uh, maybe branded into your brain like a branding iron. Remember that the law of Moses is the word of God. The law of Moses is the word of God. The commandments are God's divine will, his divine word. It's, it's uh, the, the book of Proverbs uses the euphemism wisdom. Whenever you see wisdom in the book of Proverbs, it's talking about the commandments of God, that all of them and, and, and none of them. And this is what you understand. There, there are none of the commandments of God have ever gone away, nor will they ever go away. Some of them are, you could say, in suspended animation, if you will, not because of us per se. In other words, there are some commandments we cannot fulfill today, such as the sacrifices at the temple. But uh, and by the way, like there was a comment on the on the, the live feed on I forget which video. Somebody, somebody out there. Pardon me. Somebody out there, I don't know who they are, but they made a comment and it said, um, since the ark is of, of the covenant has been missing since the first temple. Why would we build a temple or something like that? That was something to that. Event. And uh, first of all, how do you know it's missing? You ever find it curious that the people who aren't looking for the ark are the Jews? I'm just, is just, I'm not, not a conspiracy. I'm just throwing this out there. Everybody's trying to find the ark of the covenant, except for who? The Jewish people. Could it be because it's not lost? Just saying. According to um, some well-thought-out ancient ideas, the Ark of the Covenant is well hidden within the catacombs, if you will, the 
crevices, the caves of of the Mount of Moriah, the the Temple Mount. Um, so there's that. I you know that's my theory. I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying it's it's my theory. I go off of reality that the only the only people who are looking for the Ark of the Covenant are Gentiles. Number two, um, I don't know. I'm just, I have this wild and crazy idea. It's totally loony. It's way out there. It's tinfoil hat. But here is my wild and crazy tinfoil hat idea, which is just probably just a big eye roll. And that is that when we have the third temple, maybe it's in our time, that God will reveal the location of the Ark of the Covenant. I know that is wild and zany. And totally, 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 totally creepy. But that's my idea too. <laughs> so isn't it isn't it interesting people's thought patterns? You see how we limit God. Um, but anyway, I digress. This is not about the Ark of the Covenant. I just wanted to mention that. So look, there's certain things we can't do, but by and large, um, the commandments are still active today. They will always be active. There, it's the word of God. And what we see, the common the common thought pattern that we see from every prophet, right? Let's just stick with the prophets. What is it that we see in here with the prophets? Well, every single prophet has said, come back to God's word. Come back to God's word. Come back to the law of Moses. Why were we expelled from the land? Because we weren't following God's law. Every During the book of Judges. Every time a, a, a world power oppressed us, why did they oppress us? What was the reason? What was the root cause? Answer, because we were not being faithful to God's holy Torah, the law of Moses. When we were being faithful to, to the law of Moses, we were undefeatable. Is that, is that the proper word? We were, uh, you know, you couldn't conquer us. When we, when we were not being faithful to God's holy word, we were beaten. This is a reoccurring pattern. What, what in, in the discussion of the kings, what made the, uh, the kings? Well, you know, it's... Uh, the reality is, is that an, an, an evil king was a king who did not follow the, the Torah of God, the law of God. A good king was somebody who followed the law of God. This is the over and over and over and over and over again. We see this pattern. It's like if you're on the side of right, then it's because you're following the law of Moses. And if you're not, you're on the side of evil. As I've said before, you cannot find one biblical hero, not one. Anybody that you esteem in the Bible, whoever they are, there is not one of them who was not Torah observant, a Torah observant Jew, by the way, not one of them. There's nobody in the Bible that you can say, my favorite character is, name them, name he or her, he or she, he or she, here. my English is not right today. <laughs> it feels not right, but I don't know. You English scholars, feel free to correct my English. But name name them, whoever they are. You not you can't name one person that is a biblical hero that you say, man, I really like her. I really like him. Who wasn't a Torah observant Jew? Not one. Zero. Zilch. Nada. You can't find one biblical hero that you could say, man, I really love David. I really love Saul. I really love uh, I don't know Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, jo uh, Joshua, Joseph, Moses. Uh, anybody, you can't find anybody, Boaz, you can't find anybody who wasn't, a, a, I'm talking about a man, who wasn't circumcised. Not one. In fact, it was David when he faced Goliath. What did David say? When David faced Goliath, I want you to pay attention. What did, what did David say was going to be the down or the reason that Goliath would fall? Some would say, well, it's because he said that he would, you come at him with a sword and spear, but I come out with you in the name of God. No, that's not it. The reason that David initially said, this guy's going to fall, there's no, no doubt, 
when he was standing in before the king and said, "There's this guy's got, I'm, I'm going to fight him. He's going to lose. And here's why. Do you remember? It's because David said concerning Goliath, he's an uncircumcised Philistine. What does that mean? It means he's not in the covenant. Rebetzin is right. So is Jim. They were not in the covenant. That's why David said this guy's not going to make it. Because he's not in the covenant. If you're not circumcised, you're on team Goliath. It just is what it is. Think about all the despots in history. <clears throat> Think about, oh yeah, you know, Sherry, right. Even the greatest hero of all, Yeshua, of course, naturally. Me personally, I, I the reason I don't mention Yeshua is because obviously he's like, you know, divine. But but it's but it's perfectly fine to include him. Obviously, but yes, even he. Think about it. He got circumcised. He he he. Yeshua was completely rabbinic. I, and by the way, I promise, Bezrat Hashem, I am going to here within the next, but sometime before Rosh Hashanah, God willing, I am going to produce a video. It'll be live like this, on. Yeshua the Pharisee, and I'm going to highlight all of the many proof texts that um, show that Yeshua was a Pharisee. It's so obvious, but with God's help, I've been wanting to do it for a long time, and the, one of the challenges is there's so much to point out that it's kind of a little bit overwhelming. Uh, but anyway, I've, I've wanted to do it before now, but you know, we've been busy with a lot of different things trying to get uh, squared away here, but coming to a point where that's going to be, um, more accessible Baruch Hashem. And I also, by the way, have not forgotten about the video to, uh, take a tour of the mikvah. And I actually, you know, we've got a lot going on now, but I, I I'm going to do that very, very soon. I, I promise you, I have not forgotten. It's on my mind. We're going to make it happen. So listen, I also want to point something else out. Okay. By the way, do you want to be on Team Goliath? Oh, I, oh, I mentioned the despots. The, so the despots of history. Okay. Think about all the people in history who have basically wanted to get rid of the Jews and, and, and the commandments, right? They, no, no circumcision, no Sabbath, no Torah observance of any kind. Think about who these people are, okay, in history. You're talking about the Pharaohs, the Caesars, the Adolf Hitlers, the uh, uh, the Stalins, right? Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, Epiphany, yeah, Epiphanes, yeah, Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, you're talking about some really, really bad. I know I'm leaving. I feel like I'm leaving some people out. You know, some of the some of the uh, the, the, the Russian Pomgrom leaders, you know, the Russian czars, uh, some of the, the Asian leaders, the communistic Asian leaders. I mentioned Stalin. Oh, Lenin. Lenin, these other one. You think about who these people are, the people who want to get rid of the commandments throughout history. And, and I, I know I've, I've left a bunch out. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, anybody want to be on that team? It's it's kind of like, you know, when you when you when you look at comic book villains and you line up all the comic book villains like from you know you have all you have batman robin and superman and green lantern and all those guys right and then on the other side you have all the super villains the, the super villains are the ones who are anti-torah and set and so this is the problem so we make our religion anti-torah like we're against you know don't, have, don't keep the sabbath don't get circumcised don't you know eat kosher don't do any of those things that are talked about in the word of god because it, to do that means you're actually on God's team of grace. Well, God's team of grace wouldn't, you know, if, okay, here's the point. You're up there preaching about how all this stuff, all the Jews are ignorant. The Jews don't know what they're doing. The Jews are doing all this legalism stuff and they should get rid of the Sabbath, get rid of the Jewish holidays, get rid of Rosh Hodesh, get rid of the food laws, get rid of circumcision, 
basically get rid of everything the Bible tells us to do. And you know who's giving you hand claps and going right on, right on, right on? Well, in your corner, rooting you on, it would be like Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Karl Marx, you know, Ramses, you know, the Caesars. I mean, think about it. That's not good. That's not good. So then we have the words of Yeshua, which are always important. You know what's beautiful about what I just said? Not because I said it. But because everything I've just said up until now is indisputable fact. It's not an opinion. This is what I love about Lapid Judaism. Is it doesn't require a bunch of theological gymnastics. We don't have to sit here and cut and paste scriptures from all kinds of parts and, and, and come up with a collage of nonsense. We just use our brains. That's what I love so much about this Lapid Nation is it's it's infinitely logical. And yet at the same time, you know, full of of, of, of fire and passion. But everything I just said is a, a, a fifth grader could get it. And you really think about it and you're going, holy smokes. What Rahab the harlot. Uh, stop calling her a harlot. Rahab. She's not a harlot. She's, she's a, go a godly woman. Rahab. What did she do? She embraced Judaism. She too became a, a, a Jew. And started following law, the Torah. Rabbi, how do you know that? Because we know that Rahab ended up marrying, uh, there's a difference of opinion, but some say she married Caleb, but she ended up marrying a Jewish person. And we know that because she's in the lineage of Messiah. So she had to be married to somebody. Well, in order to marry a Jewish man, she has to be a Jewish woman by the law of Moses. So even Rahab, It, it, what what, an, what the the ultimate uh the ultimate uh um redemption story it, it, uh, uh Luisa and Katura yeah Constantine I, how could I forget Constantine oh my goodness <laughs> how could I forget Constantine oh my goodness yes yeah, so look, let's look at what Yeshua says about this. The important, and see, this is all about, I haven't even got to the poor ports. I'm, I'm about to, I'm about to. But this is why the importance of the commandments is what it is. It's not a theological system, guys. It's not just, you know, a difference of opinion. You, it, it, it's, it's black or white. It either is right or it's wrong, and there's no middle ground. It's light and darkness. And this is the importance of it. We're either, you know, you're either with it or not. And so anyway, this is what Yeshua says in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 21. Yeshua says this. Now, listen, I'm going to break this down for you because it's, it's just it's just clear. He says, not everyone says to me, Lord, excuse me, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, now that's important. Let's just pause right there. That's important. What does this tell us? It tells us just, just because you call the Messiah your Lord, that's that's not enough. It's not enough. That's what's, that will, that is, listen, I'm, I'm talking now to the person who's watching who's not yet a part of Lapid Nation, but you're coming out of the church world. Okay, I'm going to talk to you right now. What you've been taught about all you need to do is confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's all you need to do. Um, that's not true. Uh, that's not true. And the one who's telling you this. Now, Yeshua and Jesus are not really the same thing, but let's put that aside for a second. That's a little bit deeper. And I don't, I don't, but I just want to make that statement so that I'm not misunderstood. Okay. 
But what you've been taught about that is simply not true. You say, well, isn't it true that that only the Messiah can save me and uh, make atonement for me? That That is true, 100%. You bet it is, absolutely. Ultimately, our atonement is found in the Messiah. And I'll talk more about this as we get closer to Rosh Hashanah and, and juxtapose that to an ancient Jewish belief about the son who was offered because it's all in alignment. But yes, that's true. However, what's not true is what you've been taught is all you have to do is confess him as your Lord. And that's all you have to do. That's it. That's a lie. And the one who told us is a lie is the Messiah himself. Yeshua, the Messiah, said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Boom, drop the mic, walk off the stage. So evidently, to according to Yeshua, there's something more than just confession of faith. There's something more. It says, but only who, listen, listen to the word of Yeshua, please. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Okay, this is this is a nuclear bomb that just went off. And that nuclear bomb has just obliterated about a million sermons that you hear on Sunday morning. Because the nuclear bomb that just went off says this. A, confession of faith and belief only is not enough. Boom, that's that's over. That just listen to me, please. And number two, the Messiah is saying, if you want to get into the kingdom of heaven, you better be doing the will of my father. So that begs a critical question. What is the will of the father? Now, something that's so important, such as the will of the father, Yeshua is not going to leave that up to guesswork. He's not going to leave that up to you know, it's really important if you want to get into the kingdom of heaven that you do the will of my father. So good luck finding out what that is. <laughs> this is going to be fun. I'm going to let you figure out what the will of the father is. And when you show up, I'll find, we'll just do some 20 questions. And of course, 99.9% .9 of you are going to be wrong. But uh, it'll be fun to see who actually figures out what the actual will of the father is. Good luck. See you. Wouldn't want to be you. No, that'd be stupid. Actually, he makes it crystal clear what the will of the Father is. In fact, he doesn't even have to say it because in Judaism is a well-known fact that the will of the Father is the law of Moses. That's a every Jew knows that. So when he's talking, he's teaching here, everybody who's listening to him knows immediately with what the will of the Father is. Every Jew knows that. The people who don't know it are Gentiles. To the Gentile, the will of the Father is whatever they think they can make up. But to the Jew, the will of the Father is the law of Moses. Now, so Yeshua says two things here who are critical. What's critical? Believing in me is not enough. And if you really want to make it, you better be doing the will of my father. And why, 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 why? So, so, so you're listening to me right now and you were in church yesterday and you're thinking to yourself, this is blowing my mind because how can this be? Well, let me explain it to you. Because belief, ladies and gentlemen, is not an expression of faith. Doing is an expression of faith. This is what James is trying to teach you in his letter. Okay. You can believe, quote unquote, all day long, but if you're not doing, you don't believe. Remember the old saying, money, you know, you, you, or, or not money, but, but you're talking about that, you know, you've got to put your money where your mouth is kind of a thing. In other words, you know, people, even in, even in our, our, our um, earthly realm here, we put the emphasis on doing whatever you're doing is what you actually believe, not what you say you believe. Isn't that true? You say you love me, but you're not doing anything. You say you want to do this, but you're not actually doing it. You say you believe in working out, but you never go to the gym. You say that you believe in healthy, eating healthy, but you're always eating junk food. You know, 
we would never say to somebody, oh, I see that you really, you know, you're eating Twinkies all day long and Diet Cokes, but I know that you tell me you believe in eating healthy, so I'm going to go with that. No one, none of us would believe that. We would all chastise somebody and say, you don't really believe that. Exactly. So if you say you believe, but you're not actually doing, you don't, you're not believing. This is why Yeshua is saying, if you say that I'm your Lord, then why am I not your Lord? Because if I am your Lord, you're going to be doing my will. That's why it's important. It's so simple. It's it, it, This is, again, why I just am so thankful that God brought me to Lapid Judaism. Because it's so logical. What's illogical is that I would call God my king and not do what he says. Or that I would believe that God is a perfect God, and yet he made a big mistake by giving us his law to begin with, and he had to come, you know, rectify himself. So Yeshua goes on and says, now many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Hello. In your name, did we not drive out demons and perform many miracles? Hello. So, hmm. What does this teach us? It teaches us that just because we've been able to prophesy, just because we've, because I've had many people say, well, man, I don't get it, Rabbi. Because in that old walk of life, I had some words from God. Okay. And well, and they were, they were, they were faithful and true. Okay. Well, Rabbi, I don't understand because in that old walk of faith, that old Roman faith, I've laid hand on the sick and I've seen them recover. Okay. And and I and Rabbi, I've seen God do some miracles for my life in that old walk of faith. And I, I okay. And I don't get it. You're telling me that, but that old walk of faith is not is not the truth. And I don't get it, Rabbi, because back then I, I man, it was really I, I was riding high on some in some points. Okay. Yeah. It, Yeshua just said, but you'll say I prophesied in your name, and, and you I drove out demons in your name, and I performed miracles in your name. And there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. You see, in the in, in Judaism, even wicked people were able to utilize the divine name, the Yudke Vavke, to perform miracles. Didn't mean they were right, but there's power, power. Wonder working power. You see? We've got to stop determining whether we're right or not on feelings, emotions, or miracles. What determines whether we're right or not is the word of God. That has to that stopped being our standard about 2,000 years ago in a little place called Rome. The word of God has to be our standard. Now, look what Yeshua says. He goes, okay, so you prophesy in my name and you cast out demons in my name. You perform miracles in my name. Hmm. Well, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Now we're talking about intimacy here. I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now, I want you to think about this. Um. He just got through saying that people prophesied in his name. People cast out demons in his name. People perform miracles in his name. And yet he's calling them evildoers. I want you to think about that. I'm going to repeat myself because I wanted to sink in. Take a sip of coffee right now. Take a deep breath. Let it out. Put the coffee down and listen. Yeshua is saying that you prophesied in my name. That would include preaching. You've cast out demons in my name. You've performed miracles in my name, which would include seeing people being healed of their disease, diseases. And yet, you are evildoers. And some translations say workers of iniquity. That's powerful sobering. What's he mean by it? Well, the word for evildoers there in the Greek is a word 
called anomia. And if you look up this word anomia, it literally means this. I want you to listen to the literal definition as pointed out, for instance, in the um, concordance. The word anomia means literally one who disregards the Lord's commandments or who is devoid of the Mosaic law. One who disregards the Lord's commandments or who is devoid of the Mosaic law. This is the importance of the commandments, guys. And people have been taught, and this is why when I drive by these places and I see full parking lots, my heart aches. Why? Because people, well-meaning, good and godly people have been taught this, that we have to disregard the commandments. In fact, it's actually taught, if you, if you pay attention, that disregarding the commandments of God, being devoid of the Mosaic law, is actually a virtue. How many of you have been have, have have heard from your friends and family when you tell them, let's use something that we use a lot because it's just a simple thing. You know, I eat kosher. And you somebody says, you eat kosher, what does that mean? Well, it means, you know, I don't eat this blah, 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 blah. Okay. Why? Why do you do that? Well, because I want to follow the word of God. <laughs> now, how many of you, now listen, don't raise your hand, but how many of you, when you say that, you would think rationally that a desire to follow God's word, aka his, his will, that most people would, that'd be like a, a hand clap, like, run on, run on, good for you, yeah, woo, no. How many of you, had when you told somebody that, they said, well, you know you don't have to do that to be saved, right? Now listen, you know what that means? You got to pay attention. What that means is in their heart of hearts, what they really have been taught to believe is that rejecting the word of God is a virtue that somehow leads to grace and salvation. And what they really believe is that by somehow following and obeying the word of God is somehow a demerit that will cause them to lose their grace and salvation. It's nutty. It's nutcase, tinfoil hat, I'm a looney tune theology. But that's what people have been taught to believe. And it's, it's heartbreaking. And it's not just heartbreaking, it's scary. Because if you believe, I just read to you Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through what, 23 or something like that. Just read, read to you what the Messiah taught. In chapter 4 of the book of Devarim. Oh, hold on a second, guys. Let me delete this nonsense. There we go. So it says, now, O Israel, listen to the decrees and to the ordinances that I teach you to perform. Now, listen to chapter four. Listen to the words, the word of God. Okay. Remember that Deuteronomy is, by the way, we're going to go over a little bit today. We'll go over a little bit today because this is going to be a short week of Aliyot, unfortunately. We have today and tomorrow. And then the Rebetzin and I have to take Hadassah. She's leaving us. We have to take her off to her next chapter of her life. And so we're going to be gone. So unfortunately, um, we won't be here. So anyway, it says here in, in chapter four of the book of Deuteronomy. Now, O Israel, listen to the decrees and to the ordinances that I teach you to perform. Listen to the word of God. He's imploring us to listen to the decrees and to the ordinances I te that I teach you to perform so that you may, what? Live. 
and you will come and possess the land that Adonai, your God, your uh, the God of your forefathers gives you. God wants us to follow. Now, listen, I want you to please pay attention. Is this microphone on? The God of creation said to us in his word, oh man, please, I wish I could just go viral with this. He said, I want you to follow the Torah because I want you to live. Now we're supposed to believe that now that Messiah has come, God says, you know what I want you to do? I want you to deny the, the, the law of God and stop following it because I want you to live. I know that I said back then that if you followed it, you would live. But what I really meant is that you wouldn't. And if you want to follow the crazy words of Paul, the reason I told you to follow the Torah so that you would live is so that you would follow it only to find out that it's going to kill you, which means I'm kind of sadistic and kind of weird. And then once you figured out that when I said that you followed it and you lived, but you tried and failed and really you would die, that somehow that would lead you back to me to now want my grace so that I would wipe out the law that I gave you and nullify the commandment that I told you to do that you would live because now you realize you can't live, that you'd actually die. And that somehow is supposed to make you like me more. Because you can trust me, right? Because before I told you to do this and it was a lie, but now I'm telling you to do this and it's not a lie. So you can trust me now more. Right. How about we go with this instead of trying to make that work, which I, I just confused myself. How about we go with this? How about we go with what God said back then is what he's still saying now because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. How about we go with God is not a man that he should lie. How about we go with this, that the word of God is eternal from everlasting to everlasting. How about we go with when God said, follow my commandments and you'll live, he meant it. And that what happened was we weren't following the commandments and therefore we didn't live. And now we need to fix that, which means we need to ask for his forgiveness and then we need to start doing what he said. How about that? Isn't that much more simple? So it says, listen to the decrees and to the ordinances. It is. It says it's noteworthy. That throughout the book of Deuteronomy, the seemingly arbitrary hukim decrees are named before the intelligible mishpat, mishpatim, ordinances. A hukim, a huk, is a law that we don't have a, it's not super apparent what the reasoning is. Uh, it's, a, it's a law that doesn't seemingly make sense to us, okay? Whereas a mishpat, or the mishpatim, are laws that are pretty, I mean, don't steal, don't commit murder. Uh, you know, those those are pretty obvious. Incidentally, kosher falls into the hukim because even though we can sit around and try to figure out why God, God told us to eat that versus that, at the end of the day, it seemingly is kind of arbitrary. Okay? But, Anyway, it says here, this stresses the fact that it is not possible to understand the Torah solely on the basis of rational thought. The spiritual side, which cannot be subjected to mere logical analysis, is the ultimate factor in the structure of the Torah. Okay, what this is really saying is that at the end of the day, the Torah is spiritual. The Torah is spiritual. This is why that in the in the uh, um, Midrash Rabbah, the Torah is referred to as the Holy Spirit, because that's ultimately what it is. Which the Holy Spirit, God, the Torah, really all one and the same thing, but. It says it explicitly that the Torah of God, the word of God, is the spirit of God. It's spiritual. Which, by the way, is why people have such a hard time with it. The Torah is not hard because it's hard because it's not. 
The tour is not hard. It's actually, frankly, quite easy. Actually, pretty simple. It's not hard at all to follow. It's a, it is such a lie, the Satan, that the Torah is so hard, nobody can do it. That's a, that's a lie. It's so not true. The reason it's hard is because it's spiritual, and carnal man doesn't want to follow it. That's really the bottom line. It's not hard. It's not hard, but it is. It's not hard in reality. It's not hard in practicality. It's not hard to actually literally do it. What's hard is to get our carnal spirit, which is animalistic, in alignment with the spirit of God. That's what's hard. Because our animalistic spirit wants to do what it wants to do. We don't want anybody to be the boss of me. That includes God. Which means that the theology we've been taught is really kind of sandbox you know, P, uh, recess, kindergarten recess theology. No, you're not the boss of me. So that you may live. This is what it says. It says the first condition for faithfully performing the law is knowledge that one is to do it that you may live. <laughs> Who doesn't want to live? And... You know, in another place, I think it's Deuteronomy 30, God says, I set before you life and death, meaning I set before you the law or not following the law. Now, what does God say? I set before you, choose this day, right? I set before you life and death. And what does God say? In case we're confused, he says, choose life. I'm just, in case you're wondering which one you want to go with, I'm going to tell you. Like God says, I give you door number one or door number two. Choose door number one. But ultimately, it's our choice, okay? So it says, for Israel, ex existence, now listen, 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 listen. Escúchame, por favor. For Israel, existence is inconceivable without the knowledge and practice of the Torah. There's no, the, the church has wondered, why can't I get Jews to come over to Rome and basically abandon their Torah observance and become pagans? Darn it. Why isn't this working? It's such a good gospel. The gospel message is believe in JC and then pretty much do whatever you want. You know, Romans gone wild. It'll be awesome. How come I can't get them to do this? And the reason is because Israel realizes their very existence is predicated on obedience and fidelity to the word of God. It does. You can't be a Jew without being Torah observant. Because to be a Jew means that you're following the covenant. Thus, the ultimate objective of Israel's existence is to give life to its law and give law to its life. When living becomes more than a merely biological phenomenon, it can endow existence with lasting value. That value must stem from that which is eternally lasting. Baruch Hashem. End of our Aliyah today. We're going to come back tomorrow and we're going to discuss more on this concept. We're going to discuss... Why cleaving to the law is so important. We're going to discuss the concept of adding and subtracting to the law of God, which is greatly misunderstood. And we're going to find out what the actual meaning of that is and some other things. Listen, I hope that this has been instructive to you. What's your takeaway? Share it in the comments. Listen, I want every, if you're listening, there's, there's at one point, there is 50 some odd people listening live. Praise God. Thank you so much for being here. I want 50 comments in this video. <laughs> And here's why, because your comments are so important to help others, to inspire others. I want you to put at when we, when this video post, I want you to please go back. I'm asking you, please go back and put your thought, your takeaway in the comments, because it really does attract people and help them to understand what's going on here. I need you to do that because I need your help to get this message out. It's a very important message. So let me know. Be sure and like this video, by the way, and share it with your friends. Like, send it out to people, right? It can help them. It can set them free. That's the whole point. The whole point here is to help people get set free. We don't want them to miss the kingdom. We believe the words of Messiah, don't we? 
Well, then we want to make sure that we don't miss and we want to make sure that others don't miss. And so be sure and spread the good word here. God bless all of you. Thank you so much for being here. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Until then, have a wonderful and beautiful day. And we will see you manana. Shalom Aleichem.